is a play written by Euripides, one of the three great Greek tragedians, the others of course being Aeschylus and Sophocles. Medea plays part in the myth of Jason and the Argonauts. There are some details which are told differently in the different versions of the myth, but Euripides' version is an interesting one. The play starts with the nurse one of Medea's servants, bewailing the misfortunes of her mistress. How she wishes Jason's Argo never sailed to Colchis in his attempt to claim the Golden Fleece, and thus Medea wouldn't have fallen in love with them and sailed with them to his homeland in Greece, where she tricked King Peleus's daughters into killing their own father. Hence, Medea was obliged to run away with them to Corinth, where she is hated, and betrayed by Jason's willingness to marry the princess, the daughter of Creon. The nurse states how Medea is devastated by this, how she is possessed by grief, how Medea weeps for her homeland and everything she left behind for Jason. She is afraid that her grief would make her dangerous. The tutor then comes in with Medea's two sons, and the nurse tells him about Medea's depression. He tells the nurse, unintentionally, that while he was walking past old men playing dice, he heard them say that Creon is going to exile Medea and her children. But he tells her to hide this rumour from Medea. She, in turn, tells him to keep the children out of Medea's sight, since Medea's cries entail danger. The nurse then directs the boys inside, and is afraid of the flames of fury Medea's grief smoke is growing. Out of grief, Medea wishes her sons to be dead, because it is the father who is responsible for the hatred towards her from all. The nurse comments that the children has nothing to do with the father's deeds. She says some bright words about how greatness isn't worth the pain it comes with, that these extreme feelings of Medea are not good, and that moderation is better. For the first time, it's the chorus's turn to speak. It has heard Medea crying and is asking for the reason. The nurse tells the chorus of what has come to be. Medea from offstage declares her willingness to end her life. The chorus comments that all are dead in a way, so why pray for death? And why mourn a lost lover? Medea once more from offstage asks the goddesses Themis and Artemis to witness the wrongdoings of Jason, who broke all of his oaths he'd made to her the, before these two goddesses of divine order and justice. Medea does not just want to hurt Jason, but to crush him and everything he has. She wants to leave him with nothing. The chorus now really wants to see Medea and asks the nurse to go get her. Although the nurse sees no point in reasoning with her, she does as asked. Medea finally comes out and tells the chorus that she just came out for them not to call her reclusive and speaks about her lost joy and her desire to die. Jason in Medea's eyes is the most despicable man. She adds that women are the worst half of all creatures. How a woman is to buy a good husband with dowry, and that husband a woman buys is to rule her. How this husband would turn out, only a wife with psychic powers could know. She argues that opposed to what men think, a man fighting in war is safer than a woman giving birth to a child. She tells the chorus that unlike them, she has no home and no family, 
and thus she asks them upon her finding a plot for revenge to not say a word about it. The chorus interrupts her to tell her that King Creon is approaching. Creon arrives at the door and orders Medea into exile with her two sons. She asks him of the reason. He tells her that the other reports he heard of her threats to punish Jason, the princess, and him. She tells him that people envy her for her cleverness and that his judgment is based on this reputation and not on any actual action. She tells him that she holds no grudge against him, the princess, or Jason. She actually wishes them good luck and begs him to take pity on her and let her be. He trusts her less now, that she seems calm and harmless. She begs him by his daughter to let her stay. When he gets fed up and threatens to forcibly drive her out by his men, she begs for one day only, just to think of a place to go to with her sons. Although he recognizes his mistake, he allows her to stay for one day. He thinks a day is not long enough for her to do what he fears. The moment he exits, she laughs and calls him a fool for what he just did. She's just been given a whole day to make three deaths. She wonders how to kill them. Should she set fire to the home, drive swords through the hearts? Then she decides to follow her favorite method, poison. Afterwards, she wonders where she can go after she's done with her revenge, if anyone is going to offer to protect her. She comes to the conclusion that it is better to wait and plot a little longer. She swears by Hecate, her chief goddess, that no one will ever cause her grief and not suffer for it. She prophesies that Jason's wedding is to be a bitter and a painful one, and encourages herself to spare no skill in getting her revenge, and reminds herself that unlike Creon and his family, she is of divine birth the granddaughter of Helios, the sun god. Though divine, she is a woman with no means to achieve nobility, but with cleverness lying in crafting evil. The chorus starts the first choral ode, singing how the world has turned upside down after Medea, a woman, has taken it into her hand to act in such a way. Since men no more keep the words, as it was always the tale, it is the woman's turn now. For years, Apollo, the god of poetry and music, has not inspired woman with lyric song to tell their own story. Women shall escape their prejudices that have held them down till now. The chorus then addresses Medea, and is amazed of Medea's journey from Colchis to Corinth to end up with a princess taking her husband from her. Jason enters and converses with Medea outside of her house. He actually scolds her, saying that if it was not her tongue she could have stayed in Corinth. He mockingly tells her that she is lucky to just be exiled, and hypocritically tells her that unlike her, he doesn't forget his friends and is willing to help her. She talks back and tells him that coming to her is not bravery and that he is a coward. She then takes pleasure in recounting how she saved his life in Colchis by helping him with the Calcotaroi, the fire-breathing bulls, slaying the dragon god in the Golden Fleece and killing King Peleus by tricking his daughters, and in return Jason has betrayed her. We need a pause here. Let's see the story from the beginning. Jason was promised to the throne by King Peleus in exchange for the Golden Fleece, and in order to get it, he has to go through three tasks. The first one is to plow a field with fire-breathing bulls that Jason had to yoke himself. Medea helped him 
by giving him an unguent to rub on his body and weapons, to not be affected by the bull's fiery breath. In the second task, he had to show the teeth of a dragon, which seemed simple, but Medea told him that it would spring into soldiers. To overcome this, Medea told him to distract them by throwing a rock into the crowd of soldiers. As for the third and last task, Jason had to kill the sleepless dragon god in the fleece. Medea put the dragon to sleep using her narcotic herbs, allowing Jason to slay the dragon and steal the fleece. When Jason returned to Iolcus, King Peleus refused to give up the throne. So Medea conspired to kill him and have his own daughters do it for her. She demonstrated her powers to them by showing how she cut up an old ram and put the pieces in a stew, worked her magic and then a young ram suddenly jumped out of it. Excited, they cut the father into pieces and put him in a pot, but the king never came to life. And they were left shocked. Okay, back to the play. Medea then condemns Jason for taking another woman when he already has two sons, which means that he neglects his fatherly duties and his oaths to her. She asks him, how could he do that with the gods watching, or if he thinks they rule the earth no more? She mockingly tells him how a marvellous husband and father he is for turning the one who saved him and his sons into beggars. She bewails the impossibility to distinguish a true man from a false one, and how Zeus should have given them a mark on the bodies, to tell which is which. Hereafter, Jason says he is like a boat pilot, trying to control his boat in the storm caused by Medea's full tongue. He denies her all of her aid for him, that it was Aphrodite, the goddess of love, who made her fall in love with him, to aid him. Contradictory, he then tells her that he is grateful for what she did for him, but that she has gained more than she's given. In the sense that Colchis, her home country, is savage, and living in Greece is much better under the sky of justice and law. That she has come to be known in Corinth due to her talents, and that if she had stayed in Colchis, she would have remained anonymous. He responds to her bitter words concerning his marriage, saying that his decision to marry the princess was the best thing, and that it was not because he got tired of Medea, but to provide for his family. By gaining access to the royal family's wealth. Accordingly, Medea's failure to see his wisdom is because women only think according to their emotions, and he says that it would have been better off with the women not existing at all. After hearing all of this, the chorus responds by describing Jason's words as well spoken but wrongly acted upon. Medea responds by saying how men whose wickedness is covered by the false words are even worse, and that if he really was a good man, as he claims, he would have told her and convinced her before actually deciding. And of course he laughs at this and at how helpful she would have been with the wedding. He again offers her his help, but she refuses, which is why he calls on the gods to witness his attempts to help which are met with rejection, and Medea in turn adds that with God's help he might hear funeral songs soon, and Jason exits. The chorus starts the second choral load, singing about the moderation the nurse talks about, but this time it's moderation and love. It prays for Aphrodite to not make extreme passions out of control, and it prays never to be exiled, which the chorus believes pushes these emotions to its extremes. Because the chorus members see the effects the exile has on Medea, and they wish for the death of whoever plays with a person's heart. Next enters the character who would help putting Medea's plan into motion. Aegeus, the king of Athens, and friend of Medea. They both wish each other happiness, and Medea asks him about his travels. He tells her of his trip to see the oracle of Phoebus, to ask of what becomes of the possibility for him to become a father. 
When Medea asks him about why then he would come to Corinth, he tells her that he is on his way to see Piteus, king of Troazen, to seek advice from him about the oracle's message. Aegeus notices Medea's sadness and asks for the reason. She tells him the story, and he empathizes with her, which is why she begs him for a shelter. In return, she would help him with his problem by making him potions to cure his impotence, his inability to become a father. He agrees to help her for the gods, but asks her to come on her own to his homeland because he wouldn't like it if Corinthians blame him for giving her refuge. And since Medea knows better than to fully trust a man, she asks for an oath to not give her to her enemies. He is impressed by a foresight and does as she asks. The chorus pray to Hermes, the god of travelers, to deliver Aegeus safely home, and with this, Aegeus exits. Medea goes on a long soliloquy, swearing by Zeus that she will get her victory and takes the unexpected arrival of Aegeus as a sign from the gods. She finally reveals her plan, which is to get a servant to bring Jason and then beg him to let their children stay. Her children would be her tools to kill the princess by sending them with poisonous dress and golden crown, which would kill her as soon as she touches them, and in turn, anyone who touches her. Her next step is to kill her own children, whom she would better kill than be mocked by her enemies. She wants to leave Jason's life and house destroyed. The chorus members declare their support, yet they urge her into abandoning her plans which go against laws of human life put by gods. Medea refuses their opinion, since they don't suffer like her, and she carries on with her plans, and they exit. The chorus begins its third choral ode, calling Athens a holy land, where the nine muses create harmony and diverse art. So how come such a sacred city holds a child killer? So they keep on begging Medea to not do it, because she is surely to suffer for it. Jason enters and is willing to listen. Medea apologizes and tells him that now she sees his wisdom in the matter, and that she was stupid and wrong for not seeing it. Medea calls the children and tells them to embrace the father. She even weeps on one of them, reflecting her fear of the destiny of exiled. As a proof of what a splendid actress she is, Jason believes her and he tells his children how secured the life is going to be and how he could imagine himself ruling Corinth in the future. Medea suggests that in order for the king and the princess to accept the children, she would send gifts carried by the boys. Jason tells her that these gifts are nothing compared to what the princess has. But Medea tells him that gifts could even win over gods, and mortals are greedy. She instructs the boys on how to behave, and they exit with Jason. The chorus starts the fourth choral ode with the lost hope of the survival of the boys, as they are already walking to their deaths. The news that the boys are spared are told by the tutor. Medea moans upon hearing the news, which puzzles the tutor and he tries to calm her down by telling her that the boys would bring her home one day. The tutor goes into the house to prepare the boys' needs and Medea starts to think about how her boys would have a home after their death, but she won't till she meets them in the afterlife, that she has raised them for nothing, the hopes she had ever since they were babies to take care of her when she's old vanishes away. The chorus agrees, parents are worn out in raising children they don't even know if worthy. 
Medea hesitates at first and considers calling her plot off, but she does not want to be laughed at for leaving her enemies unpunished. The chorus sings about the most painful grief imposed on mortals, that is seeing one's own children die. An out-of-breath servant from the palace arrives, delivering what he describes as a fresh disaster and urges Medea to flee and escape the consequences of her wicked deed. She asks them of the reason why would she do that, and he tells her that it is because the princess is poisoned and that the king is too from embracing her. Medea is delighted and calls it wonderful news. He is astonished at her reaction and asks her for the cause of it but she demands to hear everything in minute details, first so that she can enjoy it. He starts by telling how happy the servants were when they saw the children and thought that finally the matter is over peacefully. How the princess pulled on her veil and walked away, but Jason told her to look upon what he loves with love to take the gifts and to allow them to stay at Corinth. When Jason went out, she put the poisoned crown and she started to feel unwell. Her limbs started to shake and she stepped away from the mirror collapsing on a chair. They thought it was the anger of Pan, the god which caused her to panic. After hearing the princess cries, people rushed to get Creon and Jason. A stream of fire from the golden crown and the dress destroyed her flesh, which is why she kept on running trying to fling off the crown. She eventually died. When the king reached for her, he embraced her wishing to die. His wish came true when the dress clung to him when he was rising, and now they lie next to each other in the palace. Now Medea is determined to kill her children she would rather kill them herself with her own hands, since she is their mother. She orders her hand to take the sword and delay any mourning. She and the children exit. The chorus starts its fifth choral ode, asking Helios to look down at what his granddaughter is doing and prays to, to him to stop her. The screams of the children reaches the chorus, trying to escape, but no way to do so. The chorus does not know if it should help. It calls Medea miserable for killing her children, for it does not know but one miserable mother who killed her own sons when driven mad by the gods. Eno, who jumps with her sons into the sea. Jason enters, worrying about his children and fearing that his new relatives are going to avenge Medea by harming them. But the chorus tells him of what has become of them, and tells him they are behind the door. He orders his servants to open it, so that he could take vengeance on Medea. Medea appears on a flying chariot, sent by Helios, her grandfather. With her are the dead bodies of her children. Jason calls Medea the most hateful and curses her, regretting bringing her from a savage land, regretting bringing a woman who killed her own brother to join him. He calls her a child murderer and inhumane. They start arguing. She tells him that she did everything for him and he dishonored her, that she too is suffering. He calls out to his dead children, saying what a horrible mother they had, and she responds by saying that it is his fault they are dead. He asks for the bodies to bury. She rejects and tells him that she would bury them in the sanctuary of Hera, that she is going to Athens, and that he would die in shame. His head on a piece of his old ship, Diago. He curses Medea and calls on justice to destroy her, and she tells him that God wouldn't listen to a man who breaks his oaths. He wants to touch the kids, but she mocks him. 
he wants to touch them now, but before, he was okay with banishing them. He tells her he'll keep calling on gods to witness what she did as long as he's breathing, and wishes he'd never had any kids to begin with, just to see them killed. The chorus ends the play, saying how Zeus and the gods bring matters to unexpected outcomes, that what is likely is unlikely to happen, and, and what is unlikely just pause.